Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Building Community Between Law Enforcement and People with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. I'm going to hand it over to our presenters, Douglas Middleton and Shannon Ballhall. Thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Shannon Mulhall, and I work at the city of Fresno, California, as a certified Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator. I've been in this role for about eight years now, working with the, the local government on general compliance. Uh, and prior to this, I worked in disability services and advocacy for uh, deaf and hard of hearing. I'm going to go ahead and let Doug introduce himself, and then we'll get moving forward. Good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're calling us in from. And just want to introduce myself. My name is Doug Middleton. I'm the CEO of Vocation Plus Connections. We are a vocational developmental program here in the Central California. And I've been in this role for about five years, but I've been working for Vocation Plus for the last 13. I have my master's in rehabilitation counseling. Um, and this has been a, a field of passion for me for some time since, uh, since a youth. Thank you for joining us today, and thanks to uh, Transcend and the Midland ADA to, for putting us on today. Slide 10. So in this training today, we're going to share with you kind of a single case study. And it's really what we've done here in Fresno to try to work towards building community with folks with a uh, between law enforcement and folks who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's not necessarily comprehensive, and we recognize that there's much more that can be done. So here's the learning objectives that we're going to put forth for the next hour and a half how to leverage your Department of Justice law enforcement best practices. And this is really using the existing DOJ, Department of Justice resources, um, which we found to be really useful. We're also going to talk about developing resource materials for police, as well as community training for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities on how to have that safe interaction. Um, these are really different kinds of resources, but really important for each side of this discussion. And lastly, we're going to talk about the, uh, and, and give you an understanding of the importance of social relationships between law enforcement and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that's something that we have found to be very valuable to foster. Um, I recognize that today we're really not going to be talking about incarcerations. And we're not going to talk too much about victim services. Um, but personally, that's something that I recognize as a critical issue. And from the city side of things, I'm really looking to lean my energies into this in the coming years. Um, so I know that there are a lot of resources out there. Um, and we're looking forward to sharing our stories today in hopes that you can borrow from what we have and work on building and expanding similar types of programs and activities within your areas. Next slide is uh, slide 11. And one thing we want to make sure you are aware of is that the stories and images that we put forth here today are used with permission. Um, and then that's really important to us. So a lot of the, this partnership with the city came about because of a simple email. So one of the Vocations Plus Connection um, staff, Shelly and I, sat on a community of practice together. And the community of practice was focused on person-centered planning. And so we had saw each other kind of on a monthly basis. And out of the blue, I got this email from her. It said, you know, I wanted to run an idea past you. I recently had a mother of a person that our company serves express to me the difficulty with getting her son to feel comfortable around police, fire department, ambulance, et cetera. She went on, and the part that really stood out to me is she said, we need to break down the barriers that prevent our individuals from utilizing emergency services. We need to break down the barriers. And, and that hit me. Um, and so I immediately got on the phone, talked to her about it, learned a little more about this individual. And you know, straight talk here, um, she said, you know, the, the mom said, my son is 6'4". He's African American. He doesn't look like he's on the autism spectrum. And when he sees an officer, he's going to turn around and run. And I don't know what that means for his safety. And you know, as a mother, that hit me right in the heart. But also, it's just as a person, nobody wants to have that kind of fear of law enforcement, and law enforcement doesn't want to be feared that way, right? Now, a note about this email. Uh, for the government side, those of you that are working with law enforcement or ADA coordinators, 
participate in your community. Go to these community meetings and be that welcome opening presence so that someone can feel comfortable to send this kind of a, an honest email to say, hey, I'm worried about this topic and I want to work to make this better. And for those of you that are on the advocacy side of things, send that email. Send that email. You don't know what could come from it. Um, be part of the solution. Say things like, we need to work together to break down the barriers. Uh, it, it does make a difference. All right, next slide. We're on slide 14. So this email that I got from Shelley happened to coincide with our own Americans with Disabilities Act self-evaluation update. I mean, literally, it happened. I got this email in the same week that I was scheduled to meet with my liaison in the police department. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, Title II, requires that state and local governments do what's called a self-evaluation. And a self-evaluation looks at um, barriers to program services and activities that people with disabilities may face. And then it goes and creates solutions. What are the solutions? How do we remove those barriers? And how long do we think that's going to take? So I was already going through that process citywide and meeting with our law enforcement. So I brought the, this topic of this email up to my liaison. And I said, you know what? We don't want to be one of those jurisdictions that gets on the nationwide news. We want to know better. We want to do better. And so the timing was just beautiful there. So as we sat down and talked about our goals, and this was in 2016, our initial goals for a police department was to develop some sort of a tips pamphlet that they could distribute annually to our law enforcement officers. Um, they looked. At, they said, you know, let's look to expand our ADA training tools to make sure that there are some resources in there as well for our officers. Um, the community had asked that we explore a voluntary registry. So we were looking into that as one of our goals to see if that would be useful. And at the same time, our, uh, our police chief had heard about the crisis intervention training. And he had made a promise that he wanted 150 officers to be trained in crisis intervention. Um, and you'll notice uh, that many of the goals um, and acknowledge barriers that we had were related to both mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. So as I go through this discussion, you'll see that there is some overlap, some use of mental health resources, as well as those related to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We recognize that they're different. And we also recognize that they can be co-occurring. And so um, I just want to put that out there, that we know that um, mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities are different. Slide 15. So one of the things that we look to is the Department of Justice DOJ best practices. Um, those of you that are on the government side of things look to Project Civic Access. I call that the ADA Coordinator's Playbook. And Project Civic Access is where the Department of Justice um, evaluates cities and jurisdictions on their accessibility. And they have many Project Civic Access settlements related to law enforcement. And you can go through that line by line and see proactively what you need to be doing when it comes to law enforcement and accessibility. Some of it does involve uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Some of it doesn't necessarily. But it's all good resources. Um, some of the resources that we leaned on include the technical assistance guide for law enforcement. I have the hyperlink here in the slides, um, as well as their more recent document, Examples and Resources to Support Criminal Justice Entities in Compliance with Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, that one talks a lot about mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities in a package. Um, so again, those of you that are on the government side of this, look to these. And also those of you on the Community Service and Advocacy Guide. This is really where um, the DOJ thinks that jurisdictions need to be working towards. Slide 16. So one of the things that the Department of Justice puts out in their settlements is this sample communication card, or communication card. And it's really a pictograph of the common things that law enforcement officers might need to uh, use for communicating. And I, a lot of this, these cards are related to the deaf and hard of hearing 
services or, or those kinds of things. But again, what we found is that this can be used for folks with limited English proficiency, with folks who are maybe nonverbal for whatever reason that may not just be deaf or hard of hearing. So this is a free resource that's out there. And in our jurisdiction, we've issued this to every single officer. And that's one of those things that um, I remind them during our annual ADA training that they have this card issued to them. And if they don't, they should ask for it. Um, because we are checking that box that says we've provided this tool to our officers. And, and we expect our officers to use the tools that we provide. Slide 17. So uh, one of the goals that we had, again, was to create a tip sheet. And we wanted this to be something, because our officers are busy, because they have many trainings, we wanted to put together a comprehensive guide of you know, just kind of quick things that officers need to remember when we're working with folks who have intellectual or developmental disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, or communication disabilities. Um, and there were a lot, there's a lot of guides out there. And we collected them. We took a look at it. And our officer said, but I don't know what's important for my community. This is my, my liaison officer. She said, I don't know what's important for our specific community. Can I meet with the community members? And we convened a roundtable discussion um, involving different organizations that serve individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as people themselves who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, it's truly built with the community uh, because we believe that we, we should do you know, that, that term, nothing about us without us. Uh, that comes true any time you're working on a disability initiative. You need to have people with disabilities at that table. Um, so we built this tip sheet. We went through rounds of review within our community, kind of playing with the language. Um, and it, it, it's simple, it's straightforward, and we distribute it annually to our officers. And again, in my annual training, I say, officers, you have this tip sheet. You need to be reading it. You're responsible for the information on it. And we are checking the box that we have provided this to you. Um, if you need resources, here are additional resources to go with it. And of course, I'm happy to make this model available via email to anyone. Um, my contact information will be at the end of the slides. Um, and you can take it, tear it apart, build it again, use it with your jurisdiction. I really believe that you have to work with your local community to build good resources on a local level. Um, one thing with this, uh, this guide very lightly touches on uh, victim-related conversations. Um, as I'm thinking more about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as um, needing victim assistance, I'm thinking that that may be one of our next steps is to create those kinds of resources for our officers. Um, and of course, I'll be looking towards the ARC Pathways to Justice, because I know that they have really valuable resources there. Next slide is slide 18. So here's an excerpt from my um, general ADA training. Um, so I do a, a training with all staff all mixed together, so it's not just law enforcement, which makes it very challenging because you may be talking about physical accessibility, communication, access. Um, but one of the things that we wanted was to give really simple, straightforward in steps for interactions. Um, with people who may have intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, so here's just one slide from that training where we say, you know, work directly with the person. Give time and space. Take one step at a time. Use plain language, not slang. Use calm body language and seek resources to help you. But the number one thing that I I really hit on is that people are unique and behaviors vary. So you've met one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. Um, know that you're going to have to look at the person in front of you. That individual in front of you is who you're working with. Um, and so that's, that's part of our overarching goals that we had through that self-evaluation process was to enhance our training, include steps and conversation about these kind of elements. Slide 19. One of the other things that the community members asked for was a registry for um, people who have intellectual or developmental disabilities or autism. You know, other cities and jurisdictions have done registries. So we, we looked into it. Um, and personally and professionally, I think that lists are problematic. And I, I'm 
fairly resistant to creating a list for a couple of reasons. I don't think that any um, member of the public should have to be on a list in order to get services. And the second it really is, how do we keep people's information private and how do we keep it up to date? And those are some of the logistical kinds of problems with having a registry. And so I don't like to say no to something or to say this isn't viable without trying to find an alternative. So one of the solutions that we hit on is that our 911 dispatch call center um, was able to do location notes. And so when requested, people can say, hey, can you put this note on our location? And a location note is something that when they get a call to go to a certain spot, um, there may be notes from the last time that a call came out and they read those off to the officer. And so we've seen that group homes will often ask for um, that to be noted on their location. Um, 911 doesn't, at least in our jurisdiction, doesn't have the ability to put notes on a person, an individual, so we know that this is ne not necessarily a catch-all, but looking at the number of calls to residences that involve people with disabilities or group homes of those sort, um, we thought that this was a step in the right direction. Slide 20. So again, our, our chief at the time um, really wanted our officers to have crisis intervention training. He made the original commitment for 150 officers to go through crisis intervention training using the 40-hour Memphis model. And it focuses on um, de-escalation techniques. Now, one of the things that's really unique about our area is that we've expanded it to include intellectual and developmental disabilities. So it's not just focused on mental health. Um, my understanding is that cri crisis intervention trainings in most areas is really focused just on mental health. But what we do is we bring in an individual from our local um, Central Valley Regional Center who can talk about intellectual and developmental disabilities. And for those of you that aren't in California, um, what we have is a regional center, center model where we have nonprofit organizations throughout the state that are charged with and funded by the California Department of Developmental Services to provide and coordinate local services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. So we include the regional centers, the Central Valley Regional Center, in that training um, to talk about the unique needs of the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, one of the cool things that came out of this is that we now have a code word that our officers can use. If they suspect there might be an intellectual or developmental disabilities, if they say to someone, do you have a regional center worker, that may get a good response from someone who does have a regional center worker without um, triggering a negative response from someone who doesn't know what that is or, or may not. So since 2017, We've had over 350 Fresno Police Department officers who have gone through the crisis intervention training. And we opened it up to allied agencies, and we have trained over 100, 105 of their officers as well. So these are other officers, not necessarily as part of the Fresno Police Department, but within the region. And uh, currently, our chief, our new chief, has the goal to have every single uniformed Fresno Police officer uh, go through this training. And personally, I've seen the difference, those officers that have gone through the training, the way that they approach people in general um, is, is very different, and it, it is focused on that de-escalation and calming type. Um, with our crisis intervention training, the instructors that we have um, include a retired police department uh, officer, a, a, a re retired PD who is also a licensed clinical social worker. Um, a police department sergeant who's also a parent of a person who has uh, autism or intellectual or developmental disabilities. Like I said before, we've got our Central Valley Regional Center who's involved as the instructor and then the National Alliance on Mental Illness Fresno uh, chapter. So it is a really comprehensive training. Slide 21, and here's an image of uh, the first crisis intervention team. So uh, after the first year of doing crisis intervention training, our chief said, you know what, we need a specialized team 
for response and put together a team that it consists of one sergeant, four officers, and four of our county behavioral health clinicians. And what's unique with this team is that these are kind of the superstars of the CIT training but also they give them more of a plain clothes look. So they don't come in the full police department uniform, but they wear these khakis and polos because they want to be less uh, scary, for lack of a better word. They want to um, be part of the solution. And this crisis intervention team focuses on connecting community members to services, housing, and lowering the repeat response of law enforcement, emergency medical services, and emergency room visits. So really taking the time to work individually with people who may have additional needs. And it really helps supplement our um, officers who maybe haven't gone through the training yet. They can call for our crisis intervention team to come out when they suspect that something's at play. And again, we know crisis intervention is focused on mental health, yet based on the champions that we have within this uh, division, um, we've managed to keep them very connected in with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Doug to talk a little bit about Vocations Plus Connections, Inc., and also our uh, relationship building that we've done as far as um, the social aspect. Thanks, Shannon. Slide 22 here. Um, so just touching on Vocation Plus a little bit more, um, we are a vocational developmental program serving about 200 individuals a day, um, and we serve on a holistic model recognizing that you need a balance in all areas of life to be successful in any one area of life. So life skills, social skills, vocational skills. Um, and what you, you see a picture here of a number of individual staff and individuals that we serve alike um, who are part of a task force. And uh, the task force was aimed at uh, creating relationship and uh, building training opportunities uh, that are going to cultivate and, and foster those relationships between our, the population that we serve and our staff and officers and vice versa. So the officers can also you know, create those relationships. And um, through this task force, I'll talk more later, that we created um, opportunities called town halls where our officers, Fresno PD, crisis intervention team, um, were able to actually experience activities and opportunities where there's just low stress interactions uh, between uh, people that are attending Vocation Plus and then themselves. Next slide here, slide 23. Uh, you see here in a picture a, a big group of people. This is one of our first town halls with Fresno PD. And uh, I was uh, privileged to attend as well. And we had a great showing of not only participants from our program, but some professors from the uh, Fresno State's Rehabilitation Counseling Program, uh, Center by Regional Center, of course, officers were there. Uh, Ms. Mulhall joined us that day as well. And what was really neat uh, about the opportunity was our goal, the task force had a had mission to goal through this process of being able for our population of folks to see the human behind the uniform, to see the human behind the get up and the gear and all the things that really created a, a degree of separation in, in a way that we felt between um, ourselves and, and officers in the community. And we took that a step further as a part of these town halls. Our goal was to not only have interactions, natural interactions taking place in conversations, but also to have each individual participate in an icebreaker activity, but kind of an icebreaker times 10, where the focus was building that connection and recognition that at the core of it, we're all just human beings. And we all have very similar fears, uh, interests, and uh, there's a lot more commonalities than there are differences. And so helping bring down those barriers of fear and mitigating uh, any concern between our population and officers, and our officers and our population when they're facing those situations in the community that might be a little more high stress. Uh, slide 24. In addition, the task force uh, worked to create an annual Patriot Day event. And again, this was something that we thought would be a little more scale scalable in terms of how many more individuals we'd be able to affect and involve. Um, so basically what this, what this effort was is to have our individuals put on an event that recognized community first responders. So not just officers, but fire department, EMT. Uh, we actually had um, 
uh, like I said, fire department. Um, Shannon, Shannon, remind me who, who else was at that event. Uh, we had representations from each of the branches of service, as well as the uh, U.S. Marshals, the Highway Patrol. You, you, you did a great job of assembling uh, everybody who wears a uniform. Yeah, there are a number of people there. Also, Adult Protective Services. So really, anybody who we felt at some point um, in the individual service or lives they may interact with to create, again, cultivate those relationships. Um, and what we've realized is that the barrier, one of the global barriers that we are facing relative to creating these relationships is that our culture has really popularized a, a new type of relationship that's, that's based off of likes and, and the number of contacts that you have, but not necessarily meaningful interactions. And so we, we saw, we see in our community and through the interactions, not only between individuals and ourselves, um, but also potentially between officers and community first responders is that these relationships are being defined on what they're seeing on social media or what they're seeing in news broadcasts. And that's a dangerous place. Um, I think that our world really lacks that more intimate, meaningful uh, opportunities for people to relate with each other. And so the Patriots Day event, again, was focused on that. And those low stress situations is when those, re those relationships can really be cultivated and, and, uh, and fostered in a really healthy way. So it was also a neat opportunity for the individuals that we serve to recognize officers, community first responders in a positive light. Um, I think there can be a lot of negativity that floats around um, our community in general. Uh, so to be able to, to say, hey, we're thanking these individuals for putting their lives on the line, for keeping our community safe, for keeping us safe, uh, brings them into a much more positive light and allows those relationships and those, those communications to, to, more e to more easily take place. Slide 25 is a, is a few pictures here of officers posing um, with some of the individuals that we serve from our program. So lots of big smiles. Um, it was really neat to see as a part of the event the progression of those relationships, even just within an hour and a half time frame. Um, of course, we fed everybody lunch, and so you know, breaking bread with everybody and, and being able to have those, uh, those interactions and those conversations, see them unfold, and just see the level of comfort and the barriers coming down even in the moment where when the officers and um, other community first responders first arrived, it was kind of like a, a middle school dance, if you will where the, the guys are on one side and the, the girls are on the other, and our individuals were on one side and the officers were on the other, but it didn't take long for them to, to come together, and the, the level of comfort and ease that you could begin to see as they you know, shared a tri-tip sandwich together and just had small talk conversations together was really special, and it made us realize that this is, these are the types of events that we more need to replicate as the years go on and, and create as something that, as a community resource. And then this is uh, some pictures, uh, slide 26, of our most recent Patriot Day. So we've carried it on for the last three years. Um, it's been a success every year. And we also, as a part of the Patriot Day, we have a lot of fun booths. We have a dunk tank. Um, we still haven't quite been able to get Shannon in the dunk tank with us, but hopefully for 2020, Shannon. Um, but yeah, it was just a great event. Uh, you, there's a picture of the fire department um, and uh, their fire truck their rigs there and some individuals um, pictured next to it. And then, of course, we have a, a picture of a police car and an, a suited officer with some of the individuals that we serve. Um, so something that Shannon and I talked about for the following year is we've kind of gotten our feet under us relative to creating this event specifically for Vocation Plus. We'd like to bring the greater community in on it, um, so other providers similar to us, and, and be able to to actually scale it to in, in even to be able to reach even a larger group of people. Um, so that's something we're going to be looking to do for 2020. Slide 27. Uh, slide 27 has two pictures of our town hall meeting. Uh, well, the first picture is uh, two groups of um, officers and clients and staff and participants uh, circled. And the, the circle game was actually everybody threw in at one of their shoes. And so from there, each person would go around, and nobody knew whose shoes they were. But the idea was that we would come up with assumptions of who, what that person was like, and who they were um, based only on the shoe 
So it was kind of a way for us to identify that stigmas uh, impact us. They affect how we, we interact and interface with people, um, even to the degree of we might assess somebody based off the types of shoes that they're wearing. So recognizing that how, and would allow us to lead into the next segment of stigmas aren't always uh, the basis for how we need to define relationships. And so the following picture is some officers posting um, some of uh, responses to a question and for certain questions. So one of the questions uh, was things that you love. Uh, another question might be things that you fear, things that you hope for. And so all the participants uh, would go and put their post-it note on a sign. And then the facilitator of the town hall read off the post-it notes. And what we found unanimously for each question was they were all very similar answers. So recognizing that, one, we can't define relationships on stigmas and some of the things that we're seeing on social media or in the news. Um, and then secondly is that at, at every level, human beings have very common core similarities that unite us and uh, send us down the same path. Uh, Doug, before we go on, do you want to talk about um, uh, what came out the week after that um, town hall with our crisis intervention team? Absolutely, Shania. Yeah, thanks for reminding me there. So that, that first town hall was, uh, as I mentioned, the crisis intervention team uh, came. And uh, what took place two weeks after was really special and just had a tremendous impact on us and, and gave us the the affirmation that what we were doing really was meaningful. So we had an individual uh, who's been with our program for 15, 20 years and has struggled on and off uh, with some mental health issues. And one day out in the community really started going to a bout of psychosis, uh, threatening to harm others, threatening to harm herself. And so we brought her back uh, in an effort to talk her down. We brought her back to the office and we started to talk her down, but um, she continued to escalate. Uh, and we knew the crisis intervention team was trained. They were available. And we wanted to keep her in a safe situation. Uh, so we, we gave them a ring. And they came by, and they spent probably 45 minutes to an hour with her in the room and were able to talk her down. And they were able to get her to a place where she was uh, comfortable uh, receiving some medical services and some care, uh, whereas prior to she was in the office, you know, threatening to harm people and wouldn't mo wouldn't move and wouldn't budge. And so even um, you know our trained and seasoned staff who'd known her for many years, uh, as as great as they were, um, they couldn't quite get the outcome that we needed with her. Uh, but the way that the crisis in the intervention team came in there was just a calmness and presence about them. And uh, having had the relationship and the interaction with them two weeks prior uh, really gave us a sense of security with them and, and what they were about and what their focus was. And uh, they knew exactly where our office building was. There was no hesitation. Um, and uh, they even mentioned to us afterwards, yeah, when we got the call, we were like, oh, you know, we were, we were just there. And so just it just created a, a seamless uh, service from their perspective and just a, an outcome for the individual that I, I can't say wouldn't have uh, came out the same way had we not had those uh, those town halls prior to. Thank you. And it, it's really rare that you see an immediate outcome like this. And I think that is something that's unique and good to remember as we're working within the community is that um, we need to have those soft contacts first. We need to be able to make connections in advance of a crisis situation, in advance of an emergency situation. And so the uh, Vocations Plus Connections team, um, because their focus was uh, broad on first responders, uh, they also wanted to get involved with our emergency preparedness. Um, so in, I want to say, 2018, uh, last year, our fire department was doing a multi-jurisdictional exercise. It was an active shooter training for um, uh, all of the area fire departments. And they asked, um, I, I volunteer with the Citizen Corps uh, for Community Emergency Response Team training, and they asked our Citizen Corps group, um, 
are there people that are willing to be victims? So I reached out to Vocations Plus Connections and said, hey, do you, does your team, do you have folks who would like to volunteer to help our fire department with their next training exercise and being able to come out and to um, act as victims in this training so that they get that hands-on practice? So on the picture here is uh, multiple fire trucks and the Vocations Plus Connections team along with several uh, fire firefighters from different jurisdictions. I'm going to move on to the next slide, slide 29. And so again, this is an active shooter exercise. And on the screen, it's a little gruesome. I'm sorry for that. But one of the um, Vocations Plus Connections guys who got to put on makeup, uh, a wound makeup, and pretend to be a, a victim who had had a hand injury. And you know, it was a lot of fun putting on the makeup, working with the makeup artist, working with the other volunteers within that group. Um, but I think the most critical thing that happens, and the real value, is that interaction with first responders might be someone's first interaction with a person who has some sort of intellectual or developmental disabilities. And that's where we want that first interaction to happen, during the practice, not during the incident, not during the emergency. So the picture on the right-hand side um, is uh, during the triage is one of the firefighters engaging with um, one of our volunteer victims, um, looking at you know his, his triage tag and kind of having that communication. There's a great value there. So if you are in the position to extend an invitation to participate in exercises to the community, do that. And if you're in the community, ask if they, that is something that your first responders could benefit from. Is Do you need people to play victims during your next exercise? Um, and I've done this with other uh, disability groups as well, with their deaf and hard of hearing, people who are blind, people who use wheelchairs, um, in different types of exercises and training. And that's really um, helps over the years to create a comprehensive training and a better awareness and understanding of people with this disabilities existing within the community. Slide 30. And on the left is a picture, again, of our, our team that came out from Vocations Plus Connections. And on the right-hand side is a picture of um, one of our CAL FIRE uh, folks who was coordinating the training who got into a really lively discussion with our folks. Like, they were asking every single question across the board. And, and it says, small talk with emergency services. But I think that small talk gets big outcomes. Those small incidental communications are so valuable. Anytime that you can build that small talk in, you are now building relationships. It's not just the, those people who exist there. It's, oh yeah, that person that I had a good conversation with during our training exercise. Small talk matters. Build in opportunities for that small talk. All right, slide 31. One of the other town halls that Vocations Plus Connection helped coordinate for us was uh, the fire department town hall. And pictured here is the group of folks who came around, sat around the table with our firefighters at our firefighters' headquarters. Um, and it, there's such value in that open, honest conversation and discussion um, and the, the questions that get asked. Doug, did you have anything you wanted to add on this? Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Um, yeah, I think. It's, it is important that we we broke out different uh, town halls for, for different service members and, and community first responders. And um, while I wasn't at this specific one, I understand it was really impactful for our folks to actually put on the gear of the firefighters um, because that's something that has been expressed to us by parents um, and individuals alike that can be frightening. Um, and there's been stories where and there's a fire taking place and somebody with a developmental disability is not wanting to come out from under the bed because there's a, a spooky looking guy with a mask on. Um, and so for them to put on the gear and actually feel the weight of it and uh, you know have the feel to what, it, what it's going to feel like to be a firefighter and uh, see the gear put on the mask, it, it definitely gave them a level of comfort to, to recognize that it's, these, are, these are just pieces of equipment that are helping the, the firefighters in these moments of, of distress and emergency. And it's nothing that's defining the person or nothing that should be viewed as, as scary. So that was pretty important and impactful. 
Definitely. And here's a picture on the right-hand side of, of uh, one of the folks that attended the town hall putting on the oxygen tank. Um, and and uh, from the fire department perspective, you know, we wanted to make sure that someone saw what it looked like in the full get-up. Um, I have folks who have been firefighters for years, and they have emphasized the same thing, that they will respond to a fire and that people um, with disabilities or kids get scared oftentimes because they've never seen a firefighter in the full gear, the full get-up. Um, and it, it is really valuable to take the time to slow down to show this is what it takes to put on the gear. Here's what a person looks like in the full gear. Yeah, here, touch it, feel it, have that tactile experience, that real world experience with the kinds of gear that you'll see firefighters wearing. They won't be in a bright yellow jumpsuit like they are depicted in the cartoons, right? And the picture on the left hand side, there is a, a uh, that's our emergency manager uh, that shaking hands with one of the um, folks from Vocation Plus Connections as he also hugs another person. I mean, these, these are real fun conversations, but again, the value is not in having fun, it's in having that contact, having that awareness well in advance of any kind of incident. We're on slide 33. I'm going to kick it over to you, Doug. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, slide 33 here. This is something we recently did, um, as recent as last month, actually. And so this, the slide actually depicts two photos of our Special Olympics basketball team competing against uh, Fresno PD, so some officers dedicated some time uh, to come and, and get beat by our, our group of folks. Uh, we won by one point. Um, so again, but this is just another way for us to be in a, a fun, stress-free situation where we can, again, connect at the level of, hey, we got folks who like basketball and like sports. We got in other individuals who like watching it, and let's get together and, and, and find that as a, as a common place and common ground to connect. Um, so like I had mentioned earlier, we did win by one point. We're pretty proud of that. I think the officers were a bit surprised at the level of competitiveness um, that our group of uh, players brought that day. Um, they were all a little tired. But again, like Shannon had mentioned, there was a lot of small talk happening before and after the basketball game. And you know, as they reflect on the game and they're talking to the officers about you know, this shot that they made or this shot that they missed, there's just a lot of smiles and, and, uh, and rapport building. It doesn't need necessarily be these super deep, um, you know, Im impactful relationships in terms of, uh, again, the depth, but just the fact that they're conversing and interacting at a level that most people would with a common interest of basketball led to them connecting and, and building those relationships. One thing that I'll add is that um, I learned through this process that our police department has several sports leagues. So that is a, an area where you might be able to get an in as you're looking to build a program within your um, area. You know, it's recreation, it's fun, but it's also an opportunity to see a real person in a real situation and say, hey, we have more alike than different. I may be an officer, you may have a developmental disability, but we both love to play a little ball, right? And it really was a lot of fun, and our um, police sports league is looking to potentially do other sports, other pickup games like this. Um, and it, it just, it's, it's a feel-good kind of moment as well, um, but it comes back to that relationship. So slide 34, one of the other things that we made sure was to circle in our electeds and our administrative officials. So pictured here on the screen is our, our mayor of the city of Fresno, my disability advisory commission, as well as the Vocations Plus Connections Inc. Um, staff. Um, who received our Disability Awareness Proclamation last year. So every year we do a proclamation of disability awareness um, with different organizations. And what was nice is to be able to stand up in front of the city council with the mayor and say, this is a program that Vocations Plus Connection has really put their heart into. They're working and partnering with us and, and giving that recognition to them. Um, it, if you can circle in your elected officials, on the work that you're doing. Heck, even let them get the credit for it if they want. So, you know, stand back and let them talk up these programs because the more focus and attention you can get to the needs that we need to be aware that there are people who have disabilities in our community that we need to be doing things differently, that our officers need training on uh, these specific techniques and ways of working. So the more that you can get those uh, that voice out there, the better off your program will be. 
All right, so for the last part of our training here, um, we're going to talk about the training that we developed called Law Enforcement and You. And this training was focused on that part of the question where um, the mother said, my son doesn't know what to do. He's scared, right? And so we worked with uh, Vocations Plus Connection, the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, and with our, our law enforcement. And um, one of the models that we looked towards was the ACLU um, video by Marley Matlin about death and police interaction. It has some great tips broken down really easily. And so we use that as a model for creating the training that we uh, put together. And um, that's a training that we can provide upon request by the community. So we, whenever I'm at a meeting and it comes up, I'll say, you know, we have this training. If you want us to come and talk to your groups about how to have a safe interaction, what you need to do, what is it um, the, the police officers are hoping to do within those interactions, then we're happy to come out and talk about that. So the first time we did this training, it was for um, our local independent living center had a, has an annual self-advocacy conference. And so there was about 230 people in a huge conference room sitting around tables um, as we're presenting this information, how to have a safe interaction. And uh, the presenters were myself, the executive director from the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. Um, we had an officer in uniform, and then we did a plainclothes officer because we wanted to show the contrast and the difference there as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Slide 37. And, and we knew going into this that we needed to have interactive discussions. Lectures alone aren't effective. Uh, anyone who works within this community knows that throwing up a couple PowerPoint slides me is, it can be pretty meaningless if you don't actually slow things down, have conversation, ask questions. So in the picture, you'll see um, that uh, our, uh, the executive director from the state council is interacting with uh, the different tables. And what we did was we gave each table a giant, you know, those giant post-it papers and some markers, had a group facilitator so that as we went through some of these um, areas of discussion, there was uh, an opportunity for the table to interact for, for more direct discussion, not just a lecture. So the training topics that we covered were on slide 38. The training topics that we, we talk about is uh, we talk about having a wallet or visor card. Um, you know, that it, if you feel comfortable self-identifying, perhaps have some sort of card that says uh, what's important for officers to know about you. Um, in the image here, there's an example of um, a card that says, I have an autistic a spectrum disorder. Please read the back of this card. And then there's a picture on the back that says uh, things like, please take the time to understand. I may struggle to tell you what I need. And it goes through other tips on that picture. So that's an example of a wallet or a visor card. Um, every single time we do the training, they say, do you have something pre-made? And I say, no. Because you are an individual, you know your unique needs. So if this is something that is of value to you, you need to put together your um, individual specific wallet or visor card. And we've seen some of the groups actually take the time to do that. Um, on the slide here, it also has, it talks about regional center worker. And I tell um, folks in our training as well that this is something we're teaching our officers to ask. Um, and many of those folks uh, you know, in our area will carry their regional center worker card. And that is something that the regional center is prepared to assist if needed if they get called out to talk about and, and to be there as an advocate for that individual. Our training topics also cover practicing how to communicate, saying how to communicate. Communication is huge when it comes to working with law enforcement. Um, we talk about what to do if you're stopped by a police officer. Um, we talk about how to have a safe interaction, including a role play. We talk about when police might want to visit your home and what are the reasons they may come to your home. Uh, we talk about what to do if you're pulled over if you're driving. We talk lightly about um, the difference between being detained or arrested and what you need to do. And very importantly, we talk about rights for accommodations, how to request an accommodation. Slide 39, here's a, an excerpt from the training. And it says, successful police interaction. Police want to help you. 
police want to be safe, and it doesn't have to be scary. Those are the three messages that we will repeat. The police want to help you, the police want to be safe, and it doesn't have to be scary. And uh, this is a picture of my former chief of police, along with a couple of members of the community um, with big smiles on their face, you know, trying to show that, you know, that yes, there are serious incidents that involve law enforcement, and their overarching goal is safety and security. Slide 40. So another excerpt from our training. Um, the group discussion is, how do you communicate? What do you want officers to know about how to talk with you? And this is a very challenging group discussion, but also a very important group discussion. A lot of people, uh, it takes time to work through what do you mean and what does this mean for me. Um, so we'll give a lot of examples out for people to go, oh yeah, that's for me, and then the, if they can, they'll write that down, or, and then they'll practice with other folks within their small group um, saying, you know, please slow down when talking to me or it takes me longer to respond, please wait for me to answer, or I don't understand, can you explain differently? Um, one of the things that we talk with our officers about is the, the tendency for this population to uh, be agreeable and to answer yes, and, and we don't want that necessarily. And we want the folks that are going through this training, the folks that are having interactions with our law enforcement, um, to feel comfortable saying, I don't understand. And there's, there's some stigma there. I get that. There's some stigma on saying that you don't understand, but we want to overcome that. Um, another great example, I have a friend who um, she wears headphones around her neck, and every time she gets overwhelmed, she'll put her headphones on. It's noise canceling, and it helps cut out some of the uh, stimulus. And so for her, as she practiced saying, I'm putting on my earphones, my headphones, and I can still hear you. I'm not ignoring you. Um, and those are valuable, valuable discussions to have for people to practice, to go through and role play saying these things. Slide 41. Um, so here's another role play that we do is, you know, what happens when you get pulled over in a car? Um, and the very first time we did this training, we didn't use people um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities in our role play. And that was the biggest critique we got, and I absolutely agree. Um, and so the next time we did the training, that's when um, our, our great folks at Vocations Plus Connections, Inc. Uh, provided some actors for us. And we, we did the role play. And oh, I mean, there were laughs and giggles, but it was also very real and very raw um, with those actors. And the neat thing is that the two officers that you see pictured here, this is actually our, you know, in the car role play image. The two officers took time, their personal time, to come over to the Vocations Plus Connections office and run through the role play. They spent, you know, an hour and a half, two hours running through the role plays with the group. And uh, taking that time to do the role play, to have the, these real outcomes that we aren't sure what's going to happen during the actual uh, training. It, but it, it was wonderful and it was really neat. So after we do the role play, that's when we open it up again for discussion with the community and saying, you know, how did these, they stay safe? What did they forget? What would you do differently? And trying to bring it to that um, level of thought, not just I'm watching this role play, but then what would I do in that situation? And every single time we do the training, uh, participants line up. They love photos. The, you know, it's, a, it, it's one of those things of, yeah, I got to hang out with the officer. Um, and we do a lot of real talk here as well. Um, one thing that we found really effective for the question and answer portion of our training is that at the beginning, we'll hand out cards, um, blank you know, um, index cards, and say, if you have any questions, write them down. What are your questions you have for a police officer? And then we can moderate the questions that come in, because so many of them are the same. Um, and whew, this community asks the hard questions, things like, why do you shoot people? Is it scary shooting people? Is it scary using a gun? Do you get to drive really fast? And there are real, honest, straightforward answers that our, our uh, officers give. You know, there's been a few times when I've been in these trainings and I'm, I'm cringing, and yet because the officers are being so direct and honest and saying, you know, sometimes I do have to handcuff a person and, and this is what it would look like. Um, you know, and, and talking about uh, all aspects of having a contact. Um, and again, our goal is to not have to 
have anyone be arrested or detained, but really to understand um, what to do. Things as simple as keep your hands where the officer can see you, see them. Don't put your hands in your pockets. And this is our training team, or Vocations Plus Connections Inc. Um, training team. Doug, did you have anything you wanted to add at this point? Yeah. Um, one of the things, Shannon, that you spoke to last time, or in a few, a few slides ago even, was the concept of officers not using slang. Um, and I think that we think slang, you know, using some sort of terms that are esoteric or something that's specific to uh, their jobs as officers. But one of the things we talked about in a, couple, a couple days ago, Shannon, was even something as simple as an officer telling one of our individuals to uh, show me their hands. Show me your hands. And that might be taken as literally as they're taking their hands out of their pockets and walking over to them to show them their hands. Um, so educating our folks, you know, as a part of these trainings of some of those common terms used by officers unanimously or community first responders and what that means to do and then also directing officers through these trainings of, hey, maybe a better uh, form of request or instruction is to put your hands in the air. Um, so I know some of those terms are used differently in different situations, but for our folks they can be confusing. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, next image is our, uh, we did this training again with the Central Valley Regional Center. Uh, again, they oversee the um, services for intellectual and developmental disabilities and they had a consumer advisory council and I think there was about 75 people in this particular training including persons served, parents, um, workers at the regional center. And then also we've done this for small groups. So this is our independent living center had a youth bridges program and there was you know, only five people and yet it was a really valuable discussion. And again, the officers are willing to take the time to come around the table and sit and have this conversation. Um, those of you that are on the advocacy side of things, you may be surprised at how willing our law enforcement officers are to come and participate, to learn more about your community if you put that invitation out there. Put the invitation out there. Um, and, and try again, you know, really uh, good officers to work with if you don't know where to start is start with the um, uh, school and resource officers. They may have different names within your area, um, but look at those folks that are doing more of the community outreach type of policing, the community oriented policing. Um, it's going to be a good um, opportunity there to uh, make those connections. Slide 46. Uh, the most recent training we did was at the ARC Fresno Madera counties. Um, this is not the whole group that was there. We had about 100 people there. Um, but the image shows myself and the officer and, and three of the individuals who were there at the ARC. And at this point, I really do want to promote the ARC Pathways to Justice uh, program. Do a Google search, look at their information. They have a form you can fill in to get more information. And even there on the website is a fantastic conversations guide. So those on the advocacy side of things, if you don't know how to start this conversation, you don't have to come up with it. The ARC has already come up with how to have this conversation and how to um, start working within your local jurisdiction. Um, now, I did reach out to our own ARC, who we have partnered with regularly, and I said, what's going on with Pathways to Justice? And they said, we would love to do that program here. Unfortunately, we don't have the funding and the staff to do it. Um, but even without that, I, they're one of those partners within my community that I know I can lean to when I have questions, when there are needs um, for uh, related to folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. All right, slide 47. Um, it's just a drop in the bucket. It's, it's a small program. It's a small start, but I think it adds up powerfully over time. Um, and there are so many ways that we can expand from here and so many ways that um, those in the community can build off of a model like this and, and focus on it. Um, some of the next steps that we've talked about is continuing to do the training, continuing to do um, uh, town hall meetings and have social events and p potentially doing a train the trainer sort of thing so that um, the folks that are served at Vocations Plus Connection um, are the teachers, right? 
and again, I see from the city side of things that the missing piece that we have is you know this the, the need to look at the victim assistance and, and build from there and looking at potentially corrections. Um, Doug, I'm going to give you a chance here to add, add some thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Uh, it really is just one person at a time, and and to see our folks, you know, interfacing and interacting with officers and walking away, you know, that one person having a better relationship really does the trick for us. It's, it, that makes it so much so much more meaningful. Um, and it is something that I think over time, Shannon and I would like to, to scale and, and turn our Patriot Day event into something larger um, that could be more uh, available and accessible to providers in the community at large. Um, but uh, it's going to take some more time. And I think we're getting our feet under us after three years of putting on the Patriot Day um, and getting the town halls going again for, for 2020. Um, but yeah. Um, and, and we encourage you that are here on this webinar today to take a moment right now, pull out your pen or, you know, get your notepad on your phone or uh, on your computer, and I want you to write down one thing, one thing you can do this week to start building community um, with people, uh, with the law enforcement, with people um, that you serve. So I'm going to pause for a moment. Ready? What one thing can you do this week to start building community? And if a few of you want to add that into the chat, I think that would be really nice for us to see what you can do and, and what you want to do. Um, at this point, we'll go ahead and open it up. Are there uh, any questions? Thank you, Shannon and Doug. Uh, we have some questions so far. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question of our presenters, go ahead and type it into the chat box. Try to keep the question as um, brief and focused as you can. So let's start with um, what challenges did you face coordinating the town halls and, and events, and how did you overcome them? Doug, I'll give this one to you. The first challenge that we faced was the officers here, their time is precious. Um, you know, they're busy through their week. And trying to coordinate a time with them that made sense during their work day and their work week. Um, and just getting that in line. Shannon was very helpful in that and connecting us with the right people. And, uh, and that way we were able to coordinate that pretty quickly. We did do a lunch for them, you know, so logistically it made sense through their day to be able to come by, get a lunch. You know, they got to eat anyway. And, uh, and, and that was a, a, a good strategy. I think that's what we're moving forward with 2020 is we're actually going to limit the time, we, whereas the town hall previously was about a four-hour um, event. We're going to condense that and kind of synthesize what we did into an hour and a half lunch time frame. So again, it even makes more sense to for officers. So not only can we get the crisis intervention team, but we can also maybe get some people outside of that team to come as well in, in a time frame um, that makes sense for them and be able to feed them. Um, I think probably one of the other barriers, again, is just broadcasting it uh, and communicating it to other folks that we have this going on. We really want to branch outside of just our service um, model and vocation plus. And while it's certainly a benefit to the individuals that we serve, um, we could see this as being something that's certainly replicable and, and benefit the community at large. Um, and then one of the issues we had was, was a spacing need. We do have an office building that we, we focus and we, we are leasing specifically for town halls and, and things of that nature. But we recognize that, hey, the number of people that actually came, just relative to the small group that we invited, uh, we, we, need to, we need to have a larger space for them. So we'll probably end up running out um, a little bit larger of a space in the future. OK, thanks. Um, let's see. There's another question for you. How do you gauge and quantify outcomes? This is Shannon. Yeah, that, that is a challenge for us. Um, and, and we look at it as one person at a time, uh, one officer at a time. Um, but that's, that is a challenge that we're having looking forward is how, how can we really show the outcomes? Is it based on the number of people who show up to a training, number of people who um, uh, are, are, have these contacts that are uh, safe and end well. Um, I, I really don't have a good answer for that. Doug, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I think that participation is certainly something that we can look to quantify. Um, I don't know if that tells the whole story of what they're actually getting, you know, from that participation. So we have done surveys after town halls, um, and relative to what was your experience, what is what was your takeaway. 
Um, of course, we can make our own assessments based on our experience of being in a part of the town halls, but it really is important to to get the feedback from those who are participating. So that's something we're definitely going to be digging in um, the following year and creating something where we can get more um, metrics uh, relative to what people are getting from these experiences. The surveys were helpful, and we got a lot of positive feedback about you know how they felt more comfortable. Um, and I think at the Patriot Day, where we actually are able to involve a lot more people in those interactions with officers, we talked about in the future actually being a booth where you could go by the booth and at the end be able to provide some feedback on what was your favorite part about Patriot Day, um, what, what community first responding group did you connect with the most, and what was that experience like for you uh, to be able to, to definitely get some more outcome-based uh, data for us, as, and that will help us drive future town halls and future Patriot Days and other events and activities. And one of the things I will add is that this is really kind of a seed planting type of initiative in which you may plant a lot of seeds and never get to see what the actual outcomes are. Um, but when you have good outcomes, it's like uh, the, the story of the individual that uh, at Doug's organization after the town hall that immediately they said, oh, we know this address. We understand what to do. Um, and, and that is a value. Here's another question. Um, someone wants to know, how do we go about making connections with law enforcement? I'll take that one and then I'll, I'll toss it to you, Doug, if you'd like. Um, reach out to your ADA coordinator. Start there. If you, if you don't know who your ADA coordinator is for your local jurisdiction, well, they should have one. <laughs> um, that, that may be one place to start. Um, look to your community service officers and uh, the community programs that your law enforcement entity has. Um, most jurisdictions will have some sort of community outreach and, and work that way. But also think about who do you know in your community? Is uh, y your neighbor an officer? Uh, does your colleague have uh, a spouse who's also an officer? And use those inroads that you have. Um, are, are there parents within programs that you work with that have connections to law enforcement? And really work those natural relationships um, to find uh, inroads there. Um, I always say you got to look for the champions. The champions are people who, for one reason or another, they um, understand that they need to do things differently when they're working with people with disabilities. And oftentimes those champions are, uh, are family members of people who have disabilities. Uh, Doug, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd say you challenge them to a basketball game. Uh, or you, just, you tell them you're going to throw them in a dunk tank. But, uh, but on a serious note, I, I think that just creating these opportunities and these events and then inviting the officers, um, kind of like if, if, you, if you build it, they will come type of thing. And of course, Shannon has been a huge support to us in connecting us with the right people. So I definitely, first thing is reach out to your ADA coordinator. Uh, it really was that initial email that Shannon, that Shannon describes to you guys um, from one of our staff, Shelly, who and that's what kind of prompted all of these connections to start taking place. But really, I mean, I find that the, we, we create these events, the Patriot Day and these opportunities, and then we're contacting officers or EMT, paramedics. And if they have the time, it, they're, they're interested because they can definitely, they're definitely getting a lot, about, a lot out of those experiences as well. Um, and even if they don't come, you know, they can still be, if your first town hall is, is limited in the number of officers you have, or it can still be a really positive experience, and it could focus you on what your next town hall needs to look like, or um, what the focus of emphasis should be relative to your t current participants or your attendees' um, feedback. So, you know, get something on the, get something on the books and, and stay committed to it and continue to work towards you know, building those sessions, those town halls, or those events, or those activities. And as they begin to get legs, um, we find that more and more people begin to catch on that, hey, these are going on, and these, are, these have been a neat thing for those who are participating, and uh, including officers. And they'll start to, uh, to fall in line and also join in. Okay, we have someone else asking if you can give some examples of accommodations that police officers can and should provide during a traffic stop or when questioning individuals in a public setting? 
That's a great question. Um, so some of the things that we talk to about our, with our officers um, is being aware of the stimulation that's in their environment. If they are working with someone who is uh, on the spectrum, they may be hyper or hyposensitive. Um, so the, they may want to get closer to your shiny badge and, and touch the things that you have on, so be aware of that. But also, they may be overstimulated by the lights and the sirens. So can you go to a quiet place? Can you find a, a space that's going to be uh, more low key? Um, we talk a little bit about um, maintaining the calm and lowering the energy. Um, because you know, if a person does do mirroring type of behavior, then that's going to help them to calm down as well. Um, I, I will say that um, in general, some of the accommodations they may need to do include um, allowing someone to have support staff with them or a person who's there to um, be next to them during the um, interviewing process. So if the person is also deaf or hard of hearing, it's looking at how does that person have the ability to use their hands? Um, or can a person write notes back and forth? Can you use um, visual cues or really break things down? Uh, we talk a lot about one step at a time, one direction at a time. Um, really explaining Miranda rights as well is another thing um, that um, people may not understand them. And, and be aware that um, you may get a yes or a nod when it's not really the right answer. Um, we talk about avoiding lists, like was it Tom, Dick, or Harry? You know, if an option is not listed, the person may think that that wasn't even a choice. You know, or different things to do to minimize getting a false response. Things like uh, keeping your body language neutral, keeping your voice neutral, avoid inter interrogative statements like you weren't at home, right? Avoid um, conversational punctuation. Things like, oh, good, really, I see, you do, as they may be taken literally. Um, trying not to praise based on specific responses, rather giving praise in between questions so that it doesn't influence response. Um, if you're having a hard time with determining timelines, using daily activities as a reference. Um, so that, you know, if that person has a hard time with the concept of time, they may understand, though, at, at breakfast, right? Um, or things like asking the same question in different ways. And the number one thing, though, is, is expect to take more time. So I'm hoping that those are some, it helps answer your question. It's not everything, but some of the, the bigger things that um, we want to emphasize that uh, as you're having these interactions, you may need to keep in mind. Okay, we have someone else asking if there's any nationwide or state policies that require law enforcement to do training for interacting with, with people with disabilities? You know, I'm not aware, I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Doug, do you know? No, I don't, Shannon. I, there's one that I, I know of within the state of California as we're working towards um, deinstitutionalizing. Um, I recall seeing something about um, uh, areas that had, um, that were close to some of these inpatient type facilities that we were trying to work people into the community needed to do enhanced training. Um, there's so many different areas of um, perishable skills that our, our enforcement officers have to do, but I'm not positive on the requirements on the state or federal level. One thing, Shannon, I will speak to on that, though, is uh, for those for those of providers who are familiar with the HCBS final rule, which is a uh, piece of legislation that's coming down federally that affects any, any individuals who are receiving services um, using Medicaid funds, even partially funded. And one of the emphasis of this uh, new rule is that individuals need to be have full access to community um, and, and probably more in-depth and um, accessible ways than they're receiving in some of their site care facilities. So I wonder that if that may prompt uh, a need, even higher need for, for training at that level for officers being that the level of community access for people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities is being um, encouraged and, and propelled by legislation. So again, 
whether it be access to resources um, or there might be actually more touches and more contacts by officers with people with disabilities with understanding that this new role is, is creating more opportunities for them to be in the community um, and outside the facilities that they're uh, familiar with. Uh, someone else is asking is if there's a universal sign for intellectual or developmental disabilities. As in a visual symbol or American Sign Language or I don't understand the question. Yeah, actually it's not that clear. I thought that maybe it meant a symbol, but it could also mean a sign in, in sign language too, I guess. You know, one thing. I understand it's a little controversial, um, but sometimes uh, people have used the, the puzzle piece as a sign for autism. Um, that's one of those things that I, I, I do tell our officers is a clue, but across the board it's not, uh, you know, uh, the adopted symbol and it, it doesn't represent everyone and some, for some people there, there are issues with that. Um, Doug, do you know any uh, specific signs or symbols that represent um, intellectual or developmental disabilities? No, not a generalized symbol um, that would be used in a situation like that. Uh, but I mean, that just goes to speak to the more we can create a level of understanding and comfort of, with officers and the individuals that we serve. Of course, there's every individual's unique. But then for them to be able to identify, hmm, there might be a developmental disability, um, the sooner they're able to identify that through a process um, and, and interacting in an emergency situation or a crisis situation with the individual, the better, because then that's going to probably change their approach and maybe prompt them to ask questions differently. Um, and so I guess to that more speaks to the, the relationships that are needed to be able to give those officers that groundwork um, to, uh, to make those identifications early on in that process. Uh, someone's asking about how best to find an ADA coordinator in their area. Well, any jurisdiction that employs over 50 individuals should have a designated Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator, and it should be posted um, on their website along with their ADA notice. Now, those are the shoulds. <laughs> it's not always po uh, evident, and it's it, not all jurisdictions have an ADA coordinator that's easy to find. Um, I usually will say give the Google search, search ADA and the name of your jurisdiction or city or county, and see what pops up. And if you don't find anything meaningful, uh, call your, your city or county helpline. You know, uh, we have a, an information line and say, you know, who is your ADA coordinator? Start asking those questions. Um, if they don't have someone, they may hustle to get one for you. Um, but I, ideally, if you're living in an area that has a, an ADA coordinator where that is their sole job, that they understand disability, they understand inclusion, that's going to be a really good inroad. So I don't know if that fully answered your question, but that, that's what I would do to try to find an ADA coordinator. Here's someone commenting. I'll, I'll read this. Um, they say, I wanted to comment, the Virginia Department of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing does similar trainings with law enforcement and found, just like you, that role playing is very important and we want to include it in more community involvement. It's another question. Uh, so you mentioned that your program is small at the moment but growing. Is there anything that would look different about the program if you had more resources? Well, first, thank you um, for sharing the Virginia model. And, and again, I've got a background in deaf and hard of hearing services, so I, I, uh, I have a little extra heart for that. Um, if we had more resources, you know, the biggest resource that I wish that I had was more officer time for training. I mean, granted, we've already got officers going through 40 hours of training, and yet I think there's more that we could do there. Um, and, and a greater outreach within our community of folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities, because I, I would love to be able to have more of that one-on-one -on -one contact um, with the community and with our law enforcement. Doug, what would you do if you had more money and resources? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, resources in our industry uh, are hard to come by, but I, I think that we would, we would scale what we're doing to a greater extent. Um, you know, our, our Patriot Days events and our town halls are limited financially. Um, I spoke to some space needs. Um, I spoke to the fact that, you know, we, when we put on these Patriot Days, we are 
putting up booths and, and renting certain um, activities that people can participate in together. Uh, we're putting on a, a tri-tip lunch, you know, so where they're, they're getting a tri-tip sandwich. So obviously with, with more resources and funds, we could, we could branch those, uh, those efforts way, way out beyond what we're doing and to be able to, to create more contacts and, and bring more people in on those experiences, which would be our goal. I will also add that, like I said before, I would really love to see us expanding um, our victim services. I've got to do some more research and investigation, but I, I've really got a, a fire for the victim side of things now, um, understanding that, um, unfortunately, um, folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities have a higher rate of victimization and greater needs and less understanding um, by our um, first responders, and so that's something that I would do if I had more resources. Uh, let's see, here's another comment that someone made. They said, one might be able to see if there is a reduction in the number of individuals with mental health conditions or IDD in jails and prisons uh, to document the effectiveness of your training. I worked f at the state office of persons with disabilities and there were numerous individuals who were arrested in, in jail uh, or in prison. It was heartbreaking. There's a comment there. Thank you for that. Yes, it's actually, um, I don't have the hard statistics now, but we are seeing um, some quantifiable outcomes within our crisis intervention team. So I'll have to go and, and look that way. I, I kind of overlooked that. So thank you for your comment. Uh, here's another kind of a long one, but has a has a question here. Maybe we'll wrap up on this. Uh, it says, "Do you think the Invisible Disabilities Association's National Disability ID program could have value to improve communication? This program would uh, provide a voluntary ID of disability status to be added to state drivers' licenses." and state IDs. Does California have any pending legislation for such a program? Um, I know that earlier you had commented that you guys thought that, um, you know, having people on lists is, is, is an, an issue. What would you think about this idea of having some kind of a voluntary identification on, on a license or an ID for invisible disability status? Doug, do you want to take a stab at that first? Do you want to try first? Yeah, um, I, I think it, I think it's, I think it's a good idea. Um, I, the the issue that I think may be faced there is uh, disclosure in other areas of their life. So, for example, if they were to get a job somewhere and they need for their uh, tax forms and verification of uh, uh, residency in the United States, they have to have some couple forms of identification. If they're submitting that ID card, at that point, they're whether it's intentional or not, they're disclosing that they have a disability to that employer, and there's a lot of protection surrounding that. Um, it's not always it's, you're not obligated to disclose a disability as a part of a an employment process. So, I see, certainly see the benefits of having um, that in place in in an emergency situation, but I can also see something that's uh, so integrated in that person's life is an ID card or a driver's license that's used for multi, you know, it's a multifaceted uh, piece of identification. Uh, it, it may not want to be disclosed in those other uh, situations. Thanks, guys. First, we'll have to stop here because we're almost out of time. So let's go to slide 49. So for a certificate or a credit, if you, if you pay to, to receive that, the code is interact. Again, that code is INTERACT. So you can check the reminder email for instructions for what to do with this code. Um, we need to have the, the code emailed to um, ADA training at transcend.org by 5 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, December 18th. And again, you'll receive an email that reminds you of this. Uh, slide 50. So the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center is a member of the ADA National Network. Uh, which is 10 regional centers which provide guidance and training and material on the Americans with Disabilities Act. You can call your local ADA center uh, by calling 800-949-4232, and you can visit the network's website at adata.org. Slide 51. 
So the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center um, is a project of Transcend Inc. Um, who is hosting this webinar today. And if you're in our region, you can call 800-949-4232, toll free, or you can call our direct number at 301-217-0124. You can send us an email at adainfo at transcend.org and visit our website at adainfo.org. So for Shannon and Doug, I would like to thank everyone for joining us and have a wonderful day.